a tougher game than I thought it was. Oh, I got, you got me again? <laughs> Harris, thanks for joining us in this lovely setting. You're probably wondering what this slightly guillotine looking contraption is in front of us and between us. I sort of am. <laughs> it's actually a Connect Four board game. So this, the show's called Skin in the Game. So the idea is that we're going to play a game. Connect Four. Oh, it's like when I'm five. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're in Miami. We could have probably played dominoes, but then we would probably, probably have smoke cigars and have the hats and stuff. But That wouldn't be bad. <laughs> that, that wouldn't be bad at all. Would you like to play a game? <laughs> I don't have much choice, do I? <laughs> nah, I'll be silver and you'll be gold. Sounds good. You know the rules, right? Yeah, yeah connect four. All right, I'll give you, you the first? honor. Go ahead. Really? Yeah. Harris, you consider yourself a value investor? Yeah, I do. How would you describe what you do compared to, let's say, like a cap, uh, a classic Warren Buffett value approach? Well, I think he takes a very long-term approach to stocks, and I'm usually more nimble. I'm trying to find opportunities and turn over the portfolio more rapidly. I'm not trying to capture a 10-year move. I'm trying to capture the meat of a move, usually during an uh, oversold situation. So that's usually either a situation where a stock is down just because of earnings or a sector's down dramatically because the sector's underperformed, like energy right now. Uh, but I'm looking for something that's down a lot. I'm looking to see it rebound, usually over the course of a couple of weeks, couple of months, maybe a year, capture 70, 80% of that move back up and move on to the next uh, situation. I'm not looking for something to own for 10 years. So it's important for you for the turn to already have happened? Every situation is different. Um, if you're looking at uh, an earnings miss or something like that, and we're having a lot of them this quarter, then you're going to buy it the second, third day, not usually the first day, but uh, you're going to buy it on the way down. You're going to average in, maybe sell some puts to end up into your position, and then you're looking to get it on the way back up. How do you think that value investing has changed with the, you know, the whole explosion of passive investing and ETFs and algorithms? It's been taken over away from the humans and given to the computers. And the computers really are calling the shots. And the way the computers work, they're all kind of programmed by the same people. They all have the same models. So when they say sell, they all sell. And they all sell at the same time. And what you see right now is that there's no logical, natural buyer when all computers want to sell. The guys who can allocate money discretionally, they just less and less of them. And they move slower, and they're not there that first day. And you get huge down moves when something goes wrong. And because people are so short-term focused now, and they're so focused on what's going to happen next week, next month, next quarter. They're missing out on what's going to happen in, out a year, out two years. And so there's no logical buyer. And that creates great opportunities because things drop way more than they should. And I've found myself more and more investing in what's down a lot and what's missed earnings as opposed to what's growing. The market goes in cycles and these cycles uh, keep evolving and I have to evolve with the cycles to where the opportunities are. When I started my career, I was buying small cap growth companies. These are usually 50 to 100 million market cap where you have great opportunities for growth and you're coming into them at single digit multiples, often low single digit multiples while they're growing quite rapidly. What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day, our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just $1, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com, and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. These are usually 50 to 100 million market cap where you have great opportunities for growth and you're coming into them at single digit multiples, often low single digit multiples while they're growing quite rapidly. And I had lots in five and 10 baggers investing in that. Now those stocks are horribly overvalued unless it's in some sector that everyone hates. And the opportunities are slower growing companies that missed earnings by a penny and it's suddenly down 40%. Or some sector like oil and gas where 
it's just been bludgeoned so much that no one is touching it. And I see a lot of companies at low single digit cash flow multiples, and it's just silly. Uh, you know, these things are misvalued on any timeline of past history, unless you think everyone just starts uh, driving EVs tomorrow, which I don't think is going to happen. You know, if I'm taking a longer term position, I, I really want to make three to five times my money. If uh, it's more of a trade, then I'm going to look to have the, the, the gap down, the miss, basically regress and hopefully capture third to half of that move. And really, every situation is uh, different. And a lot of times I'm just using uh, the gap down to sell premium, which means that if I uh, uh, end up owning the stock, I'm okay with it because I'll own it another 10% cheaper. If not, I'm going to capture my 10% and move on with life. And, you know, you just... It's kind of three buckets to, to think of, premium, uh, owning outright, or owning long-term. And your macro, you, you look for situations all over the globe, correct? Correct, but I'm mainly focused on the U.S. and Canada to a lesser extent. I just feel like rule of law and liquidity and transparency are so much more important. And also in the, the U.S., uh, if something does change and the sector starts to evolve back on the positive side, there's so many people watching still, and there's so many computers that if it comps positive, suddenly have to buy as opposed to sell, that uh, when things go well, it goes well rapidly in the share price. And you don't have that overseas. So six months ago, when everything was just, you know, lock limit up all over the world, it must have been a little more difficult to find those situations. Are uh, you finding uh, more frequency now or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this summer I was bored. I just sat there and did very little. I had a couple key positions that I bought earlier in the year and kind of yell at the screen and say, why aren't these things going up? But <laughs> yeah. eventually they went up and uh, I've had a great year and I sold out of those positions. A lot of them doubled, a few tripled, and we're, we're on to uh, new positions now. Um, you know, I've had a lot of cash. I kind of uh, negative right now in the world. Uh, I, I kind of think uh, equity prices are going to drop quite a lot. And so I've been a lot more nimble, a lot more liquid stocks and uh, really just waiting for that drop to happen. So you're keeping your powder dry right now or are you fully invested? Combination, actually. Um, I'm keeping a lot of powder dry, but I also have written a lot of puts in the last couple of weeks just because of earnings. There's been a lot of misses. So if I get a signed stock, I'm a signed stock. If not, I'm going to have a 10% month and move on. Do you want to tell us about a particular position that you have now that you're excited about? Well, yeah. Let, let's talk about uh, some sectors that I think are great, where right now the computers miss. And I'll move on to a stock. Um, I think the computers really miss when something comes out of bankruptcy, for instance, uh, you have the situation where the computers aren't watching, no one's really paying attention, it's not in an index, computers aren't thinking to track it, there's not uh, multiple quarters, you can look backwards in terms of history, and you have these stocks that are just abandoned. And my largest position is a situation like that, it's uh, Mongolian Mining Corp. Okay. It's a formerly bankrupt Mongolian coal company. Uh, it has everything going against it that you can imagine. It's coal, everyone hates that. It's Mongolia, everyone hates that. It's frontier markets, everyone hates that. And it's uh, bankruptcy reorg, everyone hates that. So naturally, it's very cheap. And I think it's trading at uh, less than one times cash flow. It's probably about half of one times cash flow after tax. And I don't know what the right multiple is for a Mongolian cooking coal mine. I, I don't think anyone knows, really. There's no comps. But I know that globally, uh, cooking coal mines are four to seven times. And I'd figure a Mongolian one should trade a very large discount to that. So maybe two times, three times. And if it gets to two times, I'm gonna make four times my money. If it gets to three times, I make six times my money. And I also have the lottery ticket that they're talking about building a railroad. Right now, they're actually trucking six million tons a year of coal to the Chinese border. 200 kilometers is just a fleet of trucks doing it. And it's very expensive. If they build this coal mine, this railroad, which I think will eventually happen, no one knows when, it's gonna reduce the cost by $20 a ton on six million tons, which is $120 million, which is, Pretty uh, dramatic when you look at the market cap at about 180 million today. If that doesn't happen, though, you know you're, you're into this a uh, little bit more than half of one times cash flow. If that does happen, it's even cheaper. Plus, volumes will go up, and the difference right now it's a 15 cent stock. This is Hong Kong, so there's 10 billion shares outstanding at 15 cents. But I think it's probably worth uh, 60 to 90 cents today. If they build the railroad, I think it's worth five to ten dollars. So you have that sort of optionality, and it's really cheap. I like those sort of situations. And it's a situation where no one talks about it, no one thinks about it. I don't know when it's going to unlock. I just know it's going to unlock. And if it doesn't unlock, they're going to pay off all the debt in 18 months and have a giant dividend. The business is doing great. Cooking coal prices are up quite a lot this year. I think they're going to stay up just because uh, cooking coal market's tight. 
Uh, if you look at what's happening in China, they're shifting a lot of their uh, factories from the coast inland just because they don't want pollution in their cities. They want pollution in the rural areas, which is uh, increasing demand for uh, coking coal right on the Mongolian border, basically inland from the main cities. So it's taking uh, demand away from the seaborne market and shifting it towards Mongolia, which is good for Mongolia, good for Mongolian mining. And uh, production's up, exports are up. Everything's going great. I just need someone to notice the stock or more than one person. I don't know when it's going to unlock. I know it's going to unlock. And at half of one times cash flow, I can be patient because not much has to go right for it to revalue. And I like situations like that. Do you have any kind of big picture view of what's happening now? I think the number one big picture view right now is interest rates. Uh, if you look uh, around the world, every currency, every yield curve, every duration uh, component, they're all breaking out. There's a 30 year chart in the US. It just broke out of, you look at shorter term charts, they were basically inverse head and shoulders everywhere. It's all breaking out. And when you have so many different breakouts at the same time, it's probably a trend change. Interest rates go in generational cycles, 30 year cycles. And we just ended a 30 year cycle. No one in the markets right now, or almost no one, has invested during a time when rates go up. They've only seen rates go down. I think you're going to see a huge change in what's happening in the markets. When rates go up, the value of everything else, every asset goes down because it's all valued on cash flows. At the same time, cash flows go down because interest rate uh, coverage goes up. And I think you're going to see a lot of situations where companies today look conservatively leveraged and 100, 200 basis points more interest rate will actually lead to them being highly leveraged from a cash flow coverage side. The uh, buybacks and dividends are going to end. Uh, debt pay down is going to begin. And I think you're going to see a lot of situations today where you have reasonably good businesses where two, three years from now, what's going to be left is an equity sliver on the enterprise value and a huge debt component. And you end up with a lot of these, I guess, publicly traded LBOs. And if the guys do a good job and pay down debt, it's all going to come back to the equity side and you're going to have the opportunity to make a lot of money. If guys can't figure it out, you're going to have a lot of restructurings. I think it's going to be an opportunity to do a lot of smart things when that happens, whether it's on the equity or the debt side. And for the first time in a while, there's going to be a lot of blow-ups, which is where I'm spending my time. Do you wait for that process to get underway before oh, absolutely. you invest? absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to be patient. Uh, what I've learned is that when something goes bad, it usually gets worse. And if rates keep going up, uh, it's probably going to get worse. Between margin compression and uh, interest costs, these guys are going to get squeezed hard. And it's not going to be the first uh, or second uh, gap down where you even have to start thinking about it. It's going to be obvious when the time is to pull the trigger. Are we supposed to be trash talking? <laughs> So would you say that nowadays environment is akin to what we saw with the great financial crisis in 2008, or is it more of just a overextension of valuation on equity like we saw late 90s, early 2000s? I think it's a lot like the 70s when rates go up and uh, values keep going down and increasingly cash flow goes to interest service. And you're coming at this from such low interest rates that you don't need interest rates to go to 10, 15%. The move from uh, zero to 300 bips right now has been extreme, but you have interest rate floors in place, so you haven't really seen it at companies. The move from 300 to 500 bips, that's going to that's gonna stretch a lot of companies. And you don't really need the rates to go up that much. And yes, I think uh, it's going to be a dramatic repricing because right now, equ equity is priced in the future. So equities are pricing in uh, future earnings growth, often funded by buybacks and suddenly they're going to be pricing in earnings declines as everything goes to interest coverage. And when that repricing happens, it's going to be very dramatic. With a look forward, I think you're going to see a lot of companies, 20, 30, 40 times earnings that are at five times earnings. And it's going to do a lot to equity. It's a very terrible time to be long equities, unless you're in equities that do well when rates go up. Do you do any type of anticipatory like work to be ready to have the bed set, so to speak? What you see happen is when things go bad, they don't just go bad and then get better. They just keep getting worse for a while. Eventually, you have a big bath. You have a CEO change. You have something that resets uh, the, the deck where expectations are so low, they can't really get much worse. And you have a situation where hopefully things start getting better in the business. And usually at that point, all the computers have moved on and you see it and no one else sees it. You got a full quarter to do something about it. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm preparing ahead of time. Sometimes you just see something down 50%. You say, huh, I never heard of this company. Let's go learn something. But more often, 
you can watch this thing for a year or two in slow motion collapse before it gets really exciting. So you think that, do you think that there's gonna be some sort of algorithmic apocalypse? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I think a lot of the strategies kind of do the same thing, so they're just gonna feed on each other. And they're all gonna say sell at the same time. And you're gonna learn that there's no natural liquidity in place for a lot of these things. And I really do think this uh, way down in the market is gonna be periods like we just saw where the market drops kind of 1% a day every day. And you know, you'll have a little basing and that happen again. But I think you also have mini flash crashes along the way where all computers say sell and there's just no natural buyer. Meanwhile, the ETFs in the world just get unloaded. And if you look at the ETFs, they're really clogged up with a couple key names. They're all the ones that went up. So when you go to sell, all those key names then clog up the sell orders. It's not the companies that have one basis point allocation. It's the one that have a couple hundred basis points, maybe even a thousand basis point allocation. And they, all the ETFs have the same stocks and they're all gonna have to sell at the same time. And I really do think you're gonna have some mini flash crashes. I don't know if it's individual company names or it's sectors and the whole market, but I think there's gonna be great things to do if you're patient and you have liquidity. Do you have some sort of uh, anticipated holding period? You know, if I'm looking at stuff that's just down a bunch, sometimes it's a couple of weeks, sometimes it's a couple of months. If I find something that's really cheap, like this Mongolian mining that I think is a multi-year trend, I can own it for a couple of years. I've already owned it for two years. So you're always looking for the next juiciest setup of the cheapest company you can cycle your money into. When it comes to owning something longer term, it's really uh, a situation where I have to at least see a triple. I'm usually looking for a five bagger with minimal downside. And as I said, these are beaten down sectors that everyone hates, yeah. which means, and I think it's important to point out that if something's down 90%, the move from down 90 to down 70, that's a triple. The move from down 90 to down, you know, 40, 50, that's great. And you don't need it to retrace the whole move. Sometimes it doesn't retrace the whole move. Uh, I'm just looking at something that's down a lot. Do you have a recent trade that worked out really well? Yeah, let's talk about a company called Amia. Uh, it's one of my biggest winners last year uh, and this year. It's a company, the management is blazingly incompetent. Uh, some of the stupidest <laughs> people I've ever seen run a large company. <laughs> they took a company with 200 million of cash flow over almost 15 years and had nothing to show for it. They just reinvested the money terribly. Um, anyway, they had, uh, it's a company that's loyalty uh, business. So they had a loyalty program with Air, with Air Canada called Aeroplan. You know, when you use your credit cards, you get points, you redeem the points. Yeah. It's a very good business. And anyway, Air Canada broke the agreement with them. They said they're not gonna renew the agreement in three years time. So the stock dropped almost 90% on that news. And I looked through it and I said, well, in the next three years, they're gonna earn this much money. In the meantime, even when the agreement ends, Air Canada is only 20% of the business. It's still 80% of the business. I think you have over 150 million of cash flow. And you have a company that it had at the time when it was trading $1.50, you had a company that only had a 200 million market cap. Plus they had a lot of cash. Plus there was gonna be three years of almost 200 million a year of cash coming in. Plus they had other businesses which could be sold. I put together some of the parts and figured it was worth 15 to 18. And I would have been right if not for management having a fire sale of assets to their drinking buddies and screwing shareholders. Uh, fortunately, there's so much value there that these guys couldn't figure out how to screw it up. <laughs> At least until friends of mine who are activists got in there, fired management, put things in order, uh, stopped the fire sale, and saved value for investors. Uh, I still think it's probably worth uh, six to 10 a share. And I came into it at uh, low twos. I bought a whole lot more when I got into the mid ones. One of the things about me is I have conviction. I'm gonna just keep averaging down. I made it a 30% position. And I sold wow. most of mine in the mid fours. It was a great trade slash investment. I only did it for about 15 months. The reason I sold it at half a NAV is in, in my opinion, NAV takes a long time to close the gap. If you have a situation where you have just a sum of the parts and it's hard to analyze what the pieces are worth and you have a lot of cash, and there's not a lot of growth. So you have this sort of asymptote where over the next two years, I think it'll close that other half of the gap and it's a double from here. And I tend to think I'll do better with my money recycling it. Oh, I know your tricks.
So Harris, you mentioned activists. Are you an activist? No, I don't see myself as an activist. Uh, I try to be long invest with uh, management. Uh, I feel like if I am engaged, I can hopefully help management and create value, not fight management. But in this situation, management just had to go. They were just so awful. And the longer they stayed, the more value they're going to destroy. And so sitting around uh, a couple of my friends drinking some beers, I just came to the conclusion that in Canada, you have this uh, ability during your annual meeting to withhold your vote. And if more than half the people withhold votes for uh, a board member, they have to resign under Canadian law. And so in this situation, I said uh, to my friends, let's withhold our votes. And I have a blog. I have a lot of people follow me on the blog. I started writing. I'm withholding my vote. These people don't deserve our vote. They need to be fired. And a funny thing happened. People I've never met before, they started ringing me up. And they said, you know, you're right. My firm, we, we never vote. We, it's kind of stupid. We're going to withhold our vote. We, we have a seven-figure position. We're going to withhold. And then this other guy, and then another guy. And we, we got 48% of the shareholders to withhold the votes. Uh, we had a couple guys write uh, press releases. It was just this funny situation where no one led the charge. It just was obvious to everyone these guys needed to go. Just no one had thought that they had this ability to withhold the vote and force them out. And as a result of us getting to 48%, we didn't quite win. Two board members resigned, the CEO resigned, and two new board members came in who were representatives of a very large shareholder. New CEO came in, and suddenly there was adult supervision, and things started getting better. And that's what ended up unlocking the value. From the time that the new CEO came in until uh, the time when Air Canada went hostile and offered to buy the whole company, uh, it was about six weeks. Do you organically come across investment opportunities or do you have a network of people? I have a lot of friends I talk to. I'm on the phone all the time. It's, I mean, in this business, you can't, as a generalist, you can't cover everything. So you have to have people you can call in different sectors. Hey, what does this mean? What's actually happening? How are these people? What's management really thinking? What are they really doing? Like, you, you need that. And then people usually come to me with their problems. I come to me with my problems. When I say problem, it's, I bought this. I thought it was really cheap. It's down 25%. What, what did I miss? Well, I didn't miss anything. I was just a little early. And I've been averaging down. They'll tell me I've been averaging down. Oh, great. It's 25% cheaper than someone really smart just paid for it. I love that situation. One of my larger positions right now is a company called Sandridge. Carl Icahn, he came, he's one of the smartest guys alive. His cost base is 15 or 16. The stock today is at 10. Since that time, it's a Nat Gas company. Nat Gas is up almost a dollar. It's 350. It was 250 back then. So it's more profitable. It's a better company. He put uh, five of eight board members in place. He's cleaned up the company. They've moved assets around. They've sold assets. They've generated cash flow. It's a better company than when he got involved. Yet, I can come into it a third less than what he paid for it, knowing that he's going to do something to unlock the value for me. I love situations like that when smart people came to something they think is cheap. You had a, a process to sell a company. They got bids at 13. You're at 10. So you know there's a guy willing to pay cash at 13. If Carl Icahn paid 15, and I'm at 10. I think I'm in a good spot. I like situations like that. If I had a book of those, I know I'm going to get value creation. What if you see a smart guy that's puking a stock? Does that affect your decision making? Sometimes. You just call them up. Why are you selling? Oftentimes they won't tell you. Sometimes they will. A lot of times people sell stocks for all sorts of reasons that aren't very logical. You know, funds close, PMs move around, just stuff happens. Or they have a different view on the sector. They have a different view on how they're supposed to allocate their capital. Stuff happens. Just because someone sells doesn't mean something. Uh, obviously, you take that into account, but it's part of a much bigger picture. Every time the S&P kicks a company out of their index, I always go research it because that's just a market cap weighted thing. So you have a stock that's down a lot, hence the market cap's low. It doesn't fit into their threshold. And now millions of shares are going to hit the market. And there's usually no logical buyer because how many small cap uh, funds are left? There aren't a lot of small cap funds. If you look at what's happened to the fund universe, Everything's gone bigger, because if you're successful, you raise more money, you get bigger, you don't touch small cap. If you're not successful, you get redeemed. So there's no one playing around in these 50 to 100, 150 million market cap area anymore. And when uh, an index has to kick it out, there's no logical buyer, which means that usually drops a big volume day, usually drops some more. And there's a great opportunity potentially to buy something good. I'm not saying all these are great companies. A lot of them actually are companies that are dying. But sometimes there's a great opportunity. And it's, it's worth pointing out, too, that just because something's down doesn't mean it's a good investment. A lot of times stuff that goes down is going to go down further because it's dying. I've spent a lot of time lately in shipping. Uh, shipping stocks have been obliterated. Uh, very uh, big picture in shipping. Uh, you have supply demand. It's like most uh, businesses. And because of low interest rates, they ordered a ton of boats. 
Guys just kept ordering boats. You have these things where these boats aren't earning a profit, they're actually losing money. And guys are just saying, well, I could borrow at 80 ba basis points from uh, a Korean shipbuilder. Yeah, I'll take five boats. You know, I have to put up no equity or minimal equity. Sure, add two more. And so you have all these boats hit the water and there's just not enough cargoes. And these things have been obliterated. And there's been great opportunities to make money in these. And I'm not very bullish on too many of the sectors of uh, individual shipping, but sometimes they just overshoot. You have these situations where these things trade 20, 30% of nav and you're just buying steel. And yeah, they're not really making any money. They're kind of breaking even, but you're just buying steel at 20, 30 cents in the dollar. And you know that if they just liquidate the whole company, you're gonna make many times your money. And there's just great opportunities. And eventually what happens is you have this little gap in new uh, deliveries, like we saw a year and a half ago in dry bulk. Dry bulk rates were just destroyed. Well, it went from really shitty to sort of shitty. And a lot of these stocks were five baggers. And I just watch for that. Right now we're seeing this in LNG, where there was a ton of overordering in LNG in preparation for L all these LNG plants to come online. And for two years, you had a bunch of boats sitting around with nothing to do. Well, suddenly these LNG plants came online and uh, charter weights went from 40,000, they're 150,000 right now. Guys went from making small money, losing a little money, to making lots of money. And if you watch these trends and see these cycles, you could have bought a bunch of LNG companies at way below NAV. And right now the market still hasn't picked it up, which is one of the funny things you see, where if you think of shipping and you think of how computers work, and it's this weird dichotomy where if rates are really high right now, okay, so rates got high in LNG, it, it happened uh, October. So they put out Q3 numbers, all of them in the last week. Well, you're looking at uh, where rates were not in Q3, but because of the length of the charters, a lot of the charters that happened in Q3 got signed in Q2 when rates were even lower. So earnings didn't improve, which means the machines didn't see sequential growth in revenue or earnings, so they didn't get excited. What's gonna happen in Q4 is a bunch of the stuff signed in Q3 is gonna happen. Eh, you're gonna see incremental improvement. But in Q1, you're gonna see all the charters signed in Q4 at 150, 175 flow through. And these LNG stocks are gonna go screaming just because the machines have to buy it because it's gonna show sequential revenue growth, sequential EBITDA, whatever the metrics they look for in growth, it's gonna screen well suddenly. So your sweet spot is, um, is smaller to mid caps, correct? Small, I think you'd call them probably pico caps. That's really? under 250. Yeah. I think the real sweet spot's this 50 to 100. When you go below 50, you don't really have a business. You, you, know, you have a couple employees, a couple assets. It's really, really fragile. Plus, there's no liquidity. And even for me, I need some liquidity to move around. In that 100 to 250, 200 range, you have a real business, real assets, real uh, employees. There's something of a business there that someone else would want in the future, whether that's a competitor, it's a PE buyer, there's an active liquid market in business sales, component sales. And so you can actually figure out what the values of the pieces are worth. And at the same time, you're below the uh, Russell 2000, you're kind of in that Russell 3000 range, you're below the S&P 600. There's no indexes that own this. What you see is when things start going slightly right and it gets reabsorbed into the indexes, you see this real inflection where the value will kind of go like this and then like that as soon as it gets into the indexes, because you have this incremental 20, 30% of the float that has to be bought. It's Miami, we should be playing dominoes. <laughs> Seriously. I think I got one. Oh, you got it. <laughs> nice job, man. Harris, thanks again for coming onto the show today. Really enjoyed playing this game of Foursquare with you. It's been good to be here. Really awesome conversation about your investment style. Uh, learned a lot about value investing, what's working these days, and I, we really appreciate your time. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.